here to announce a few more immediate measures. International students need to be prepared for life in Canada and we have a responsibility to make certain that they are well supported when they come to Canada. So starting in January, on January 1st of next year in 2024, the financial requirement for study permits will be raised to reflect the current cost of living. And as such, a single applicant will need to show that they have $20,000, 20635 in funds to support themselves in Canada, moving up from $10,000. I'd also like to update you on three temporary policies affecting international students that were set to expire by the end of the year. The main purpose for an international student to be in Canada is to study. However, since most students are currently halfway through their school year and some are working full-time to meet their needs, we will extend the temporary policy that has allowed eligible international students to work more than 20 hours per week. So next year we intend to implement targeted pilots that will test new ideas aimed at helping underrepresenting cohorts of international students to pursue their studies in Canada. In, in response to the labour market disruptions over the pandemic, we introduced a temporary policy granting post-graduation work permit holders an additional 18-month open work permit if needed. Uh, those with a post-graduate work permit expiring by the end of this year remain eligible to apply uh, and we won't be extending that policy after that. It would be a mistake to blame international students for the housing crisis. Ahead of September 2024, we are prepared to take necessary measures, including significantly limiting visas. Enough is enough. If provinces and territories cannot do this, we will do it for them, and they will not like the bluntness of the instruments that we use. Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon to you. First want to acknowledge uh, that we are gathering on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, we're proud that Canada is a top destination for talented students from around the world. International students contribute to campus life and Canada's multicultural spirit in communities across the country and are drivers of innovation. When we welcome uh, international students, we benefit from new ideas and ways of learning and researching coming into our post-secondary system predominantly. However, some of these students have experienced serious challenges navigating life in Canada. A few weeks ago, I announced initial reforms to the International Student Program, uh, including the development of a new framework to recognize learning institutions that provide top quality services and support, including housing to international students. It would be a mistake to blame international students for the housing crisis, but it'd also be a mistake to invite them to come to Canada with no support, including how to put a roof over their heads. It's why we expect learning institutions uh, to only accept a number of students that they're able to provide for, able to house or assist in finding off-campus housing. In welcoming international students, we have a responsibility to make sure that students are supported when they come to our country. We also want to ensure that international students don't become victims of unscrupulous individuals who offer them inadequate living conditions, sometimes even at inflated prices. Ahead of September 2024, we are prepared to take necessary measures, including significantly limiting visas, to ensure that designated learning institutions provide adequate and sufficient student supports as part of the academic experience. In order to achieve this result, it is imperative that we work together with provincial and territorial governments, learning institutions and other education stakeholders so we can ensure international students are set up for success in Canada. Our aim is to strike the right balance between welcoming international students and making sure they have all the need all they have and all they need to thrive. I will communicate more on this in due course, but for today, I'm here to announce a few more immediate measures. International students need to be prepared for life in Canada and we have a responsibility to make certain that they are well supported when they come to Canada. So starting in January, 
on January 1st of next year, in 2024, the financial requirement for study permits will be raised to reflect the current cost of living. And as such, a single applicant will need to show that they have $20,000, $20,635 in funds to support themselves in Canada, moving up from $10,000, as I mentioned in French. Moving to a more accurate cost of living level that helps international students arrive with necessary resources to live and study in Canada. Future increases will be tied to the low income cutoff that Statistics Canada publishes every year, similar to other immigration programs. This cutoff conveys the income below which an individual may be in strained circumstances as they have to spend a greater than average proportion of their income on necessities. Recognizing that students already have to show that they can cover their tuition as well as other travel costs or cost of living threshold is set at 75% of the low income cutoff rather than 100% and puts us on par with our competitor countries. So next year we intend to implement targeted pilots that will test new ideas aimed at helping underrepresenting cohorts of international students to pursue their studies in Canada and we also plan to work with institutions, provinces and territories to provide students with what they need to succeed and I will have more to say on this uh, a little later, earlier on in, in 2024. I'd also like to update you on three temporary policies affecting international students that were set to expire by the end of the year. The main purpose for an international student to be in Canada is to study. However, since most students are currently halfway through their school year and some are working full time to meet their needs, we will extend the temporary policy that has allowed eligible international students to work more than 20 hours per week through till April 30th of 2024, the end of the academic year. We're currently examining options for this policy in the future, but we know that 40 hours a week is untenable if you're a student and are looking to potentially expand off-campus work hours for international students up to 30 hours per week while class is in session. Our data shows us that 80% of international students are more work more than 20 hours a week. We first implemented distance learning measures in uh, 2020 due to the travel restrictions during the pandemic and reduced them in scope in September of 2022. But since the vast majority of international students are now actually studying in person in Canada, we're extending this measure only to those starting programs before September 1st of 2024. And finally, in, in response to the labor market disruptions over the pandemic, we introduced a temporary policy granting post-graduation work permit holders an additional 18-month open work permit if needed. Uh, those with a post-graduate work permit expiring by the end of this year remain eligible to apply uh, and we won't be extending that policy after that. Protecting and supporting international students from becoming vulnerable, whether that's to bad actors or simply meeting their needs in Canada, is one of the main goals of our review of the International Student Program. These students contribute to boosting Canada's economy. Taking these additional steps today contributes to our long-term goal, which is to preserve the integrity of the International Student Program. It'll be key in all this to work with our provincial and territorial counterparts, which have an important share of the jurisdiction and responsibility in this, um, as well as other education and stakeholders, including the learning institutions themselves, so that we can ensure that international students really are set up for success in Canada. Thank you, and on that, I'm glad to take your questions. Vous espérez régler avec ça parce que vous avez semblé un peu montrer du doigt les provinces et territoires qui faisaient pas tout à fait leur travail. Ce que vous avez numérique, qu'est-ce que ça va régler Puis peut-être aussi aborder le fait que en passant de 10 000 à 20 000 dollars, c'est clair qu'il y a des, des gens de certains pays qui ne seront plus ou euh, qui vont être exclus par défaut. Ben, écoutez, c'est clair que c'est pas n'importe qui, qui qui peut s'avérer des ressources pour venir au Canada pour étudier. Ça veut pas dire pour autant que ces gens-là ne sont pas intelligents, qui ne, ne participeraient pas nécessairement à l'épanouissement euh, intellectuel de notre pays. Évidemment, de travailler au Canada, de devenir peut-être des, des, des résidents permanents et des citoyens. Mais c'est clair que le niveau de la vie puis le le seuil qu'on imposait de 10 000 date d'une vingtaine d'années. Euh, il faut bien que les gens qui veulent venir au Canada sachent ce à quoi s'attendre, et surtout dans, 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 dans une atmosphère d'abordabilité et les défis que ça présente, que ce soit, que ça, que ça soit le, coût, le coût de la vie généralement ou la, la, le, le prix du loyer. C'est clair que les gens qui postulent au Canada doivent savoir ce à quoi s'attendre et doivent démontrer les capacités financières de pouvoir s'établir ici. Euh, alors, il y, a, il y a un équilibre à atteindre. C'est la raison pour laquelle 
on va regarder des projets pilotes pour s'assurer que certains pays défavorisés, certains lieux défavorisés, certains étudiants qui auraient de plein droit ou, ou, ou la capacité de, de s'épanouir au Canada puissent le faire. Mais c'est clair que dans le contexte, il fallait absolument agir pour s'assurer que ce seuil de 10 000 qui était bien en delà de, du seuil de nos compétiteurs euh, et des pays qui ont, euh, auxquels euh, on, on fait de la compétition, euh, qu'on soit à ce niveau. Donc, c'était quelque chose qui était attendu depuis longtemps. Et puis, espérons, et je pense que ça va, ça va contribuer de surcroît avec les mesures qu'on a mises en place à date et ceux que les provinces mettront en place, va continuer d'enrayer la, la fraude qui, euh, qui sévit à travers le système. Vous avez parlé de la responsabilité des provinces. Euh, il y a un défi de juridiction dans tout ça. Mais sachez que du côté financier, le Canada... À court terme, n'obtient aucun bénéfice. Ce sont les provinces qui prennent une mesure des, des frais et ce sont les institutions qui sont désignées par les provinces qui prennent la majorité des frais. Il y a de l'abus, c'est l'abus qui doit être enrayé et c'est surtout de la responsabilité des provinces de le faire. Minister, you referred to the universities not liking the bluntness of some of the instruments that you might use. What did you mean by that and what do you expect universities to do? Well, Well, so, so Rafi, I'm, I'm, I mentioned institutions themselves, and they have a very large portion of the responsibility in making sure that the student experience is properly reflected in the resources that they're given, whether it's providing housing, whether it's providing proper health supports and a proper academic experience. Uh, there is a responsibility on, on behalf of the provinces that designate the learning institutions in question to make sure that those are actually the institutions that are worthy of getting visas from the government of Canada. There are, uh, in provinces, the diploma equivalent of puppy mills that are just churning out diplomas. Uh, and this is not a legitimate student experience. There is fraud and abuse, and it needs to end. Um, there have been, you know, when you, when, you, when you take, for example, the province of Ontario, there have been Auditor General reports that have recommended some very important measures that have not been put into place, and that has contributed to the uh, abuse. So the bluntness of the instruments that we have at the federal government level, in addition to the fraud task forces, is the strict removal of visas, which uh, can have a number of effects and can have ripple effects, whether we designate a particular institution in particular, or whether we simply take other measures to, to significantly reduce this. Um, The federal government can't do it alone because our, our measures and the measures that we have, the policies that we have can have ripple effects on what, um, what the portrait of, the, of, of an international student experience could look like and we could potentially miss the mark. Uh, the provinces have a number of tools at their disposal, namely the regulation of the designated learning institutions that uh, in some cases just need to actually to be shut down. Have you taken a look at what impact that extension could have on permanent residents in Canada who are competing for those same jobs with the students? Are you talking about the work hours? Yeah. Well, look, I, I, there's labor shortages across the country. Uh, the measure that was put into place during COVID was one that was designated to make sure that th those, uh, those shortages were being addressed. It was popular. People, we had heard legitimately from students that a 20-hour work week is doable and is something that uh, people could actually study at the same time and, and work 20 hours. Also, employers were looking for people that could potentially commit for over 20 hours and perhaps only work 20, so it was limiting the availability for students out there. It is costly to be a student in Canada, so having that flexibility and dealing with those two competing public policies, I think, was, was, was one of the challenges that we're still juggling with. We know that over 80% of of uh, international students are factually working over 20 hours, um, but 40 hours is just untenable. It is, it is not credible that someone, uh, except for rare occasions, could work a full work week and actually, um, and actually study at the same time. I know having done it myself, and I know lots of people that have uh, worked very hard, but those 40-hour work weeks drain you, and it is not reflective of a proper student experience. Um, but there is flexibility, and we were looking at you know, uh, an, an, an hour category in and around 30 hours, but it hasn't been decided yet. So given the financial, con the financial pressures that current students in Canada would be feeling had we 
taken a decision to roll it back to 20 hours. Um, it didn't it didn't make sense and would probably perhaps put more strain on students that are um, that are, that are currently struggling to make ends meet. Um, I don't think students are taking jobs away from other people given the labor shortages that are happening in Canada. My focus primarily is to make sure that the public policy that we have in place is one that reflects the ability of the student to actually do what they're supposed to be doing, which is study, without um, without bankrupting themselves. So there's a there's there's a there's a there's a middle ground there that we need to look at. Um, I'm going to look at more data with my team to make sure that something like 30 hours actually makes sense. But currently, with the data that we know, rolling it back to 20 hours would have been um, on the draconian end of the spectrum. A related question will, to your file. This will mean that there will be fewer international students coming in because you've raised the financial requirements for people to come to Canada. Do you have any models or numbers on that? We're currently looking at that, uh, Mackenzie. It, it, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, the reality is, is that we need uh, an international student program that is robust. Uh, clearly, we compete with other countries for some of the top talent. But clearly, we have become a country that has been uh, targeted for for uh, abuse and exploitations by some unsavory actors and we need to be able to address that uh, head on and I think provinces need to be able to address that head on and these measures are are intended to shore up the um, the integrity of the system. For now I'm not worried about the absolute number what I'm worried about is the students and to make sure that they have the proper student experience and that they are indeed studying and that the um, unscrupulous institutions that exist today that aren't actually learning institutions but are uh, you know a conduit for money going to some people that want to profit off them uh, and and potentially some backdoor entries to Canada are effectively shut down. On another topic, uh, the Americans are considering imposing visa bans on extremist Israeli settlers. There's calls for the EU to do that. Is Canada considering something similar? Look, people that commit crimes aren't welcome in Canada and the differences that we have in how we deal with specific situations that are occurring around the world and the policy tools that we have uh, in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the ones that the U.S. use are, are, are slightly different. Um, we don't want people that have committed crimes, particularly crimes of this egregious nature, given the geopolitical context, uh, make their way into Canada. Um, Canada has typically adopted a case-by-case -case basis, but it's information that we, um, we are working with the U.S. on. Uh, we aren't always lockstep on our approach with the U.S., but in this case, um, I think we could agree that people that commit crimes of this nature should not be welcome in Canada. Sir, new data shows that Canada is, uh, on average, is deporting 39 uh, undocumented migrants or people a day. Uh, that's up from two years ago. What is uh, your government's strategy? You had a promise to provide undocumented workers status in Canada. Where is that planned? The promise remains. I have told, uh, I've been quite public in saying that this is something that I will be bringing to Cabinet in the spring. Uh, it will not address all the challenges of uh, people that are here on an irregular basis and undocumented. Uh, there is a group, there's a, there's a large group of people in Canada that are Canadian um, by any other name that just don't have the documentation that we need to address in a mature fashion. Uh, there is resistance within, um, within the system. I, I would not say to you that there is uh, unanimity or in Parliament as to how to approach. There's a number of competing policies that we have to be quite, I think, wide-eyed about in how we approach this, notably in the context of, uh, of of the winds that have turned against immigration and the sense that these folks, and I resist that characterization, but I don't resist the fact that it exists, would be considered queue jumpers. Um, I think that's kind of distasteful to consider it as such at times. But I think we do have to have a comprehensive policy that addresses hundreds of thousands of people that are here in Canada, and but for the fact that um, that, that they are uh, they're, they're Canadians by any other name, and I think we need to do that in a smart fashion. I wouldn't say that necessar necessarily, and I do not want to question whether this has an impact on the people that are being asked to leave Canada. We know that there have been challenges, particularly through COVID, in enforcing departures uh, given the context. So I'd, you'd have to compare data points, but I, I think that Canada needs to move forward with a path to regular migration and it's something that I've committed to take in front of Cabinet in, in the spring. Uh, but it isn't a foregone conclusion and it, is, it does not want that comes uh, without cost or without considerations of, of other factors dealing with um, the perception around 
around cue jumping that people seem to be more and more sensitive to these days. Um, but it's something I'm working on. Average in the first two quarters alone, right? Like that's close to the total in 2021 and 2022 years where the pandemic was in place. So what is going on? Are, Sorry, are ask the question more? again, Raf. Um, 7,032 people in the first six months of 2023 alone. That's almost the same for the totals in 2021 and 2022. The pandemic was in place at that point. So what's going on? Like, are, are you at war with the CBSA? Like, what's happening? Uh, you know, that's a question for the CBSA principally, but I, you know, there, it is not the case that everyone that is in this country is entitled to stay in Canada. Uh, and I think for the same concerns about the integrity of the system that I was talking about earlier. Um, we need a process that is enforceable once due process is accorded. Uh, I wouldn't say that CBSA uh, doesn't have its challenges, that said. And um, when we deal with deportations, it first and foremost has to be done in a humane fashion after, after uh, as in any country like ours, the due process is accorded. Et pour revenir en français sur la, ce que vous avez expliqué à mon collègue, le fait que les provinces ont une responsabilité de ne pas favoriser la création de ce qui ressemble à des usines à chaud, des établissements qui ont des faux diplômes et qui, qui profitent d'étudiants. Dans certains cas, puis dans, dans certains cas, dans certaines provinces, il y a des machines à diplômes, puis c'est la réalité. Euh, ce sont des ce sont des endroits où il y a de l'exploitation, peut-être des portes arrière d'entrée au, au Canada, les gens qui profitent du système. Je, Je vise pas les étudiants eux-mêmes. Il y a beaucoup d'exploitation. Les gens ont vu euh, quelque chose de financièrement très lucratif et en ont pris profit. Alors, euh, ce sont des institutions qui sont de juridiction provinciale. La désignation de ces institutions euh, en est une qui est de la compétence provinciale et euh, doit être réglementée par la province. Et il, y a des, il y a eu des rapports de vérificateurs.
our video ends here. If you found this update useful, then please comment below and share this video with your friends and family on Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter. Thanks for watching today's update.